Praise be with that's, that's my little theme music that got me to say tonight, so don't y'all forgive me for saying it, but my theme music. Good evening, Good evening. and welcome. I'm Willis Smith, and I want to thank you all for joining us tonight in person and those of you virtually in our new room of the future. I also want to thank all the BRCC faculty, staff, and students for the privilege to serve as your chancellor. Black History Month is an annual celebration of achievement by African Americans and a time for recognizing our roles in American history. Since 1976, the month of February has been dedicated as Black History Month, honoring the triumphs and struggle of African Americans throughout U.S. history, including the events leading up to and throughout the Civil Rights Movement, as well as our artistic cultural and political achievements. One month could not possibly recognize the historical or contemporary contributions African Americans have made to this country. 365 days of a year, African Americans have fought to be recognized and respected. And our individual and personal journeys have significantly contributed to the American society. While we have learned from the social and political impact of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the courageousness of Rosa Parks that ignited the Montgomery bus boycott, and the election of the first black president, Barack Obama. We can also learn from those events that surround us every day. I may not be remembered like these monumental leaders, but as a black man and the sixth chancellor for Baton Rouge Community College, I want my story and contributions to leave a lasting impact on our community and the people I serve for years to come. Black History Month provides perspective for African Americans, yet our experiences are different based on many demographic traits. Sharing our personal journeys can lay a path forward for others. My story may start similar to many, but as one great friend told me, I am an outlier, and the differences in my experiences have shaped the man I am today. Josephine Allen, you're going to hear that quite often, better known as Happy Hill in Mobile, Alabama, was a ghetto and housing project where I spent the first 10 years of my life. My mother, a single parent, high school graduate, and what felt to me to be overly strict that time, kept me and my brother focused on family, surviving, and my dear roasting gravies on Sundays after church. <laughs> Sunday was a great day for us, full of family, faith, and great food. We would put on our Sunday clothes and Sunday best and walk to church with all of my aunts, uncles, and cousins. One day, after Sunday school ended, my brother and I squeezed in a forbidden trip down, down the street to Moses Grocery Store to buy penny candy. We ran there as fast as we could and back before the 11 o'clock service began. Running, mouth full of green now, ladies. We got back just in time to hear the church secretary call out, Willie Smith would now perform the welcome. <laughs> I had never performed the welcome before. <laughs> so I looked over at my grandmother and she pointed at me, get up there, that's you. Mouth full of sticky green candy and trying to chew the empty candy as much as possible, I approached the front, turned and called out, you're welcome to Green Grove Missionary Baptist Church. And the green candy just ran all down my face. <laughs> and my grandmama looked at me, a look I knew all too well, and I knew I was in trouble. You see, the black experience is unique, and many of you can understand the importance of going to church, as well as having a strong matriarch in the family that some of you call Big Mama of Madea. My mama was also stern and strict, primarily due to the tough neighborhood where we live. She worked hard, and it was important to her that we learn the value of saving. I didn't know how important it was Mr. Charles, a friend of hers, gave me a jar full of pennies. He told me to put it up and save it. As soon as I left the room when they were talking, I ran out the back door across the street to the store to buy and spend every last penny on penny candy, on bubble gum. Mouth full, pockets bulging. I prowled into the house with my chest sticking out. My mama asked, where you put that jar of pennies? I bragged that I spent it on gum. She took the whip of me so hard that the gun flew out all over the floor, just like a pinata had been busted wide open. 
I dove on the floor trying to save my gun while my mama was whipping me and yelling about saving. I only cared about saving my gun. <laughs> my mama's brother, Uncle Lewis, would also give me change when he come home from college. One day he gave me a cup full of quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. And guess where I went? Back to the store in Ball Candy. <laughs> while I was walking home, though, my mom's friend, Steve, was working at the store. And she called her. She said, Pat, Willie keeps coming in out of the store buying candy. You know what he's up to? You see, where I grew up, it was an unwritten rule to watch out for one another's family. I guess Steve wanted to make sure I hadn't stolen the money or gotten it without permission. When I walked in the door, my mom immediately asked, where I had got the money. I told Uncle Lewis I'd give it to me, mama. She grabbed me by the arm, marched me down to my grandma's house to confirm that Uncle Lewis had gave me the money. Standing there, sweating profusely, until Uncle Lewis confirmed he had given it to me. My mama was not too understanding of this frivolous spending, especially as hard as we had it during those times. And I have the scars on my butt to, to, to prove it. You don't mess with an angry black mother, and I learned my lesson. My Uncle Lewis, he was the first of my family to go to college. He attended Alabama State University on an academic scholarship. I admired him. When he came home, his clothes was always pressed. He had no purple and gold boots on, wearing tow. Somewhere in my family was fine in college and had great boots that he would let me march around in. For those of you in the audience, my uncle was an Omega. I did not know what that mean at the time until I was much older and attending college where I got to see young men barking hoof, 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 and stomping and marching around no purple and gold boots. <laughs> Uncle Lewis provided me my first exposure to something different and he was always someone I could look up to as I got older. While I can focus on the positive memories and the lessons I learned in the deep south in 1970 in Mobile, Alabama, you could believe there were plenty of terrible memories too. The love and laughter in that small unit in the segregated housing project could not keep out all the dangers that came with a life as a young black boy in Happy Hill. Happy Hill was known for violence, physical and sexual assaults, and the people I saw openly used alcohol and drugs daily. I didn't know my environment was anything but normal. It was the way of life for us who lived in Happy Hill or other surrounding ghettos. My mother raised me and my brother to be tough, fighters, and to stand up for ourselves, no matter what. When we was beat on, we learned to fight back. When we broke, when my brother was beat on, we learned how to fight back. There were days during those years that did not, that, that did not bring anything but fighting, violence, and police. Throughout my elementary school years, living in Happy Hill, we played in this makeshift field that we created, using the sidewalk between two housing units and one unit that ran horizontal. Anything over the roof was a home run, even if it hit an unsuspecting person on the other side of a car. <laughs> <laughs> one afternoon, bottom of the third, one of my friends called out, there was smoke over the rooftop. Thinking the car was on fire again, we all raced around the building. And as we turned the corner, we froze. There was a woman engulfed in flames. I don't remember the sound, but the smell was like something I had never ever experienced before and ever since. My father came out one of the units and smothered the fire with blanket. She lived. I later learned that she was the mother of one of my friends I was playing baseball with. And the man that did it was the uncle of another. The community of Happy Hill was very connected. We know each other. We knew each other. We grew up with each other. The following year, while some of my friends and I were visiting our football coach in the back unit of Happy Hill, we looked out the window and saw police cars pull up. Men jump out in dark suits with guns. They surrounded one of the units. They began shooting at the building. We didn't know what was going on. They blew off the door of one of the units, and in the front of the house were littered with bullet holes and smoke. Some time had passed, and they brought out a person on a stretcher. And as they loaded him into the ambulance, Rick Tick, my football coach said, that man's dead. When the flashing lights had stopped, the police and ambulance have left, we saw a white man from the local news station filming the area. He was jumped on, his camera was smashed, and if it wasn't for Reverend Johnson, the insurance man that took young kids to the prison,
to keep us on the straight and narrow, dragging that man out of that crowd, putting him in his car, and driving him out of there, I would have witnessed my second murder that day. I can experience these acts again, even today, when I let the memories resurface. You see, memories are tricky. So many come with positive and negative emotions. Happy Hill was family, and we rarely left. We didn't get to travel much, and when we did, we all went together. When I was seven years old, we took a trip to New Orleans to see a man named Blackjack, a man I would later learn was my biological grandfather. My grandmother and my dear fried chicken the night before the trip, and the next morning we woke up and we loaded into my granddaddy's Fleetwood Cadillac. Eleven or twelve of us fighting for a spot on the long, tufted leather floorboard seats. Pushed to the floorboards, the smallest, off we went. Not a seatbelt in sight. As we set out early that morning, I watched the sun come up, and I smelled the aroma of that fried chicken in the trunk. Mm -hmm. Later that afternoon, we arrived in New Orleans at chair of the hospital. I have ne never seen a hospital so big and so many people other than when it was Mardi Gras. We put into the garage, and my grandmother said, we're here. The large footballing figure that I met that day, I heard stories about when I got older, could barely walk. He was a stranger to me. He was my blood. I didn't have many feelings about it then, but what sticks out most in my mind is loaded back in that car, driving to Pontchartrain Park, sitting eating the fried chicken with my cousin as we talked, played, and laughed. It was a good time for me as a boy, and I can still remember it as it was yesterday. Happy Hill had his good and bad times, and my mother did her best to raise two boys while working as much as possible to make ends meet. When my mama went to work every day, my brother and I were presented with another life in Happy Hill by the gangsters that sold drugs. They were fathers, uncles, and friends. They had a little, more, they had a little bit more than most. A car, a lot of women, some money, and as Snoop Dogg famously said in one of his songs, this is the American dream. That's what we thought. The men in the neighborhood would congregate under a big old oak tree on the corner from my house. And there was a shaded spot, big old shaded spot with an oak tree, where they would tell a story, play cards, drink, and smoke marijuana. My brother and I, we were fascinated by that spot. But our dad made it clear, go near that spot and you get a whooping. My dad's whoopings were different than my mom. So we stayed clear. <laughs> the police was also fascinated by the crowd under the tree. And each day they would drive by, occasionally stop and frisk everyone standing there. Sometimes men were taken off, other times the police left and the crowd dispersed. My brother, my brother eventually fell victim to this and the curse of black men in the pathway to jail. He became a victim of the institutionalized culture of, of, of oppression and enslavement by the judicial system. So many others that I walked with, I walked with me happy here, ended their journey early in the cemetery. I wasn't an angel, but I knew I wanted something different. I had seen my Uncle Lewis make a new way, and if I knew if I fought hard, I could make a new way too. When I was 10, my mom got a better job with the United Way, and we was able to move across town that move not only got us out of the incredible, dangerous life of living in Happy Hill, it began a series of events that would make possible my opportunity out. Our new home was down the street from Last People Stadium, home of the, some of you may know, the home of the annual senior bowl, where college footballers competed on their way to the National Football League. Living in the house on Virginia Street, my brother and I hustled and parked cars for $5 a pop every game. And I even served, I even got a part-time job selling peanuts as a, as a vendor to the crowd at the stadium. Peanuts! Peanuts! Buy one bag, you'll want two more. <laughs> Watching the athletes compete and the people coming from all over to watch and cheer them on directed the next years of my life. I knew I had to fight to get on that field. I worked extremely hard at football and try to stay out of trouble as much as possible. Drugs and crime was not absent in my new environment, and I witnessed violence and the shooting deaths of close friends. 
But the football field was my salvation. And I kept my focus to fight on the field. In middle school, our team got the opportunity to play a football game at Last People's Stadium. Unfortunately, we lost, lost the game. And on our way back, on the bus ride back to school, I was back there cutting one of my friends, and one of my friends' dad, who went to Tulane with me, Coach Wood, holla, Willie Smith, you ain't shit. You'll never play in that stadium again. <laughs> Embarrassed? Yeah, I guess you could say yeah. But even then, I knew. I had never intended to be what people thought I would be, but always something more. This time was no different. The nagging, embarrassment, the darling words of Coach Woods stayed with me at practice, in games, lifting that iron in the weight room. I dedicated myself to make varsity and get the opportunity to play at last stadium and win. I can thank Coach Woods today. Rest in peace, Coach Woods. Thanks for the motivation. In high school, I was recruited by several many universities to play football. But none held the allure and the beautiful nature of the French Quarter except Tulane University as a young boy, 18 years old. Before I left for Tulane in 1989, my Uncle Lewis told me about his college days, drinking and cutting up on a big oak tree on, a state, on Alabama State campus. For years, he and his brother would sit up on this big old oak tree, just drinking. They mad dog, whatever, they thunderbird, they drank him. One day, he handed them the bottle. And they say, fool, where you going? He said, I'm going to get ready for graduation. His partner looked at him and said, fool, you ain't graduated. You've been hanging out with us. He said, yeah, I may have been hanging out with you, but I took care of my business. Uncle Lewis set the stage for the next four years of my life to have fun, but first take care of your business. I knew I had to be successful to make myself and my family proud. I was done with the embarrassment. The embarrassment I felt at eight years old, standing in the monthly food truck line for pot of milk and cheese, walking to the recreation center with my brother in the summer for free lunch, or by using food stamps at the store. It was all that to remind me that I could not fail, could not be embarrassed by the failure in college. Around this time, as I was out to college, did not get ready to go to college, my dad and I developed a closer relationship, stronger bond. He had lived in Happy Hill too, in a unit behind ours when I was growing up. My brother and I did spend some time together with him, but it was mostly my mama who raised us. When I was leaving for college, when I was leaving for college, my father gave me my first book, On the Mark, Putting the Student Back in the Student Athlete. It seems strange to say, say this now with as much as reading as I do, but I did not own a book until I was 18. I did not take education or reading seriously as I should have. I only wanted to be a football player. While reading this book, I was intrigued by the stereotypes of being a jock and not a student. So it prepared me for the kind of student I needed to be to handle the academic rigor of attending Tulane University. I was excited to go to Tulane University and to compete at the collegiate level and excited of the experience all that New Orleans had to offer. I quickly learned, though, that my new environment was very different from where I had come from. The academic environment was challenging, the field was tense, and the city daunting. At 19 years old, I found myself in a fight against discrimination in the classroom from teachers who did not believe that football players could be successful. Racial animosity on the field, and the cultural challenge being a black man in the South. I knew I had to mature quickly, mature quickly or be sucked into a new culture that was different from Alabama. It was in New Orleans where I would get a different perspective about life. Before coming to New Orleans, I have never seen in my life so many professional black men and women that look like me in esteemed positions in the community. I met city councilmen, judges, and lawyers. I grew proud and excited about what Tulane and the city of New Orleans could offer me on and off the field. I love playing football, but when I injured my neck, an injury that plagued me to this day, my life changed. You see, football had been so much a part of my entire life, and it had shaped so much of who I was, but I knew I had to find a new life plan. That year I was blessed with my first child. My fight had to change again, and I knew that education 
was going to be the way I provided life my daughter deserved. After graduating from Tulane, I worked a series of odd jobs, but meeting and marrying my wife Cheryl provided me the direction I needed professionally. We began our family, and I found purpose working for Volunteers of America, VOA. It was at VOA that I began working with disadvantaged youth and adults in New Orleans area. Young men and women that reminded me so much of myself, my brother, and my family. The location may have changed, but the dangers and challenges situation for these young black people was the same as that being living in Happy Hill. During this period of time, a friend of mine asked me if I wanted to help him coach football at L.B. Landry on the West Bank of New Orleans. I later found out that the kids who played for us mostly came from the Fisher Housing Project. Look it up. An area that reminded me so much of Happy Hill. Not wanting to repeat how I had grown up, my philosophy of grades or pains was met with much dismay from the players, but delight from their mother. I checked their report card frequently, and if their grades slipped, they paid for it in sweating tears on the field. Helping shape their futures academically was a life and death fight to me because I knew it was something better. The welfare of my players was important to me, and the mothers appreciated my guidance so much that they kept me well fed, my wife remembered, with turkey necks and red beans and rice. <laughs> Serving those that needed support became my biggest fight. Recognizing I could impact more lives in a management role, I decided to seek a master's in public administration. Influencing policy changes that would directly impact the lives of young black men and women I was seeing every day motivated me to complete my master's degree. Around this same time, I was recruited to return to Mobile, Alabama. So in 1999, I went to work with Mayor Mike Dow on a federal project that put social workers in the Mobile Police Precinct. For so many years, I had been cautious and raised to be distrustful of the police, and now I was going to be working alongside them every day. The program was designed to assist at-risk juveniles who were in the judicial system and deter others, deter others by assisting them with resources such as mentoring, tutoring, life skills, and to check up on them when they was at home and in school. During my time working at the Mobile Police Department, I occasionally rode along with different officers on the beat, on their beats. I watched how they police, experienced the areas in which they work. The program was recognized by Community Police and News in Washington, D.C. for the success at addressing the high levels of juvenile crime in Mobile, Alabama by reducing juvenile delinquency. The program was a success for the community and the experience helped me understand the magnitude of the issues all communities face in this country find solutions to those issues, and again, and gain a different understanding of what police was all about. In 2001, after the nagging of my wife, I returned to Louisiana to work at the Louisiana Technical College Sullivan campus. She's ready to get out of Alabama. I served as the program director for the Youth Bill Bogalusa program that assisted average youth with getting their GED, life skills, and construction skills. At the time, Washington Parish had, this, had some of the lowest graduation rate and highest dropout rates in the state and in the country. The Youth Build program focused on helping those kids that had been given up on, tough kids, smart kids, that just needed support and guidance. Housed at the Sullivan campus, a predominantly white campus, the racial disparity between the kids in the program and the faculty and the staff was noticeable. I knew I had a huge task ahead of me that I would face a lack of culture competency, but I was determined and able to convince them to work these, young, these youth and young adults. I can remember, just like yesterday, telling my supervisor and some of the other white faculty staff, you can either help them now or pay for them later. My team and I were successful working with these young people and saw 50% of our first class earn their GED and build a low-income house. We not only transferring the participant lives and got the community behind the program. But more importantly, we changed the community views and beliefs about these young people's abilities. Having had some small success, I knew that what we were doing was working and I wanted to make a bigger difference and impact on more lives on a larger scale. 
This is when I found my next opportunity in Lafayette Parish, working for La Louisiana Lafayette Technical College in Lafayette, now known as South Louisiana Community College. I was the director of a program called Keeping Youth Trained and Educated type program. I did not know I would once again be walking to a situation so similar to Mobile, Alabama, Bogalusa, and New Orleans. I had planned to work on my doctorate, but I quickly realized Lafayette would once again be a place in which I would be helping young people who face similar circumstances as all the others I had met. People not believing in them. They could become productive members of society. In many cases, the young people's own, own family had given up on them. I frequently wondered, what was this about our society that cast young black boys and girls and young people in general as something different? They were not different. They're like me and you. They have positive attributes, but they only need to be challenged. I knew that I could help these young people and believe they had something to offer. While balancing family and work, I pursued my doctor degree and became the first member of my family to earn an advanced degree. I always wanted to use my degree to serve as an example for young black boys and from similar backgrounds of what hard work and perseverance could do. So I partnered with a local group of black men and we developed the 100 black men of Greater Lafayette. We embarked on establishing a framework for change and one of our pillars was education. I served as the inaugural chair of the education committee and it took off. We would challenge the Lafayette Parish school system to put more resources in low-performing schools on the north side, the poorest side of town where predominantly black folks live. At the meeting meetings and discussion, we developed a very good work relationship with, with LPSS, Lafayette Parish School System, and they did what we asked. We were successful in advocating for more resources and better teachers for those low-performing schools. I knew that was a major win for the 100, but more importantly, it was a major win for the North Side community, for the boys and girls that we were trying to help. I was tired of seeing young black boys and girls failing and not giving a shot to succeed. They were not inferior to me, and I knew I had more, to be, more had to be done to help them find a path to a better future. My hard work and commitment, working as the kite director and as the chair of the 100 Education Committee, led to me being nominated and receiving the Men of Excellence Award by the Knights of, Lady, by the Knights of, Clay, Knights of Peter Clay, excuse me, Ladies Auxiliary of Immaculate Heart. My background and experiences, acquired skills and knowledges over the years, and the focus on education leadership, educational leadership have all prepared me, y'all, for this role today to serve as chancellor at Baton Rouge Community College. My story may sound unique to some, but there are many other black boys and girls Men and women who share similar experience living in the ghetto and have overcame many challenges to contribute to our society. You see, our society doesn't talk enough about the tough environment condition that black folk live in unless a crime has been committed, right? There are hundreds of thousands of outliers in the worst part of Baton Rouge and across our nation who only need a chance or for someone to understand their plight. I was one of them. And our stories of what this country, America, is, all, is made of, is all about. They say history can repeat itself, but I would tell you no one desires or should live in poverty. We live in a great nation, yet we are still fighting for equality, equity, and inclusion. I did not share my story for it to get lost tonight, but shed light that my experiences some 40 years ago still remain true today for others, and this must change. While we have made progress, we have many miles to go. I thought he would be here tonight, but a friend of mine, Senator Cleo Fierce, said a quote a few years ago. Well, he said, I laugh when I think about it. Martin marched so Rosa could sit. Rosa sat so Jesse could run. Jesse ran so Barack could win. Yes, we finally had a black president, and I believe it would not have been possible without the sacrifices, the stories, and triumphs of others. Yes, a black boy from Happy Hill can become a chancellor of a college. 
all of us will leave a legacy for the next generation. My life has been a fight, but I fought so my children will have more opportunities. I still fight so that the people of Baton Rouge have the educational opportunities and access to develop their talents, find their, find their passion, and support themselves and their families. That's why I take this role so seriously. I expect and demand excellence from myself and my team. Every phone call or every email unanswered, every drop or withdrawal is my family, my brother, my friends who did not get out, who wanted something different but lost the fight. I believe that we all have a calling to do things different, to support each other. I also believe that as I sit here, that no, I'm not perfect. I have made mistakes and have done some things in life that I'm not a proud of. But I also know that I'm committed on making sure that our team, all of us who are here tonight, that we look to work, at work and support each other. History, or should I say his story, is too long for one month and must be recognized and understood every day if we are to make a difference in our relations with one another. Our history should inspire others from that hot day on the west coast of Africa, some four centuries ago, where my ancestors were packed to, to capacity in slave ships, to that cold morning of January 20, 2009, on the east coast of America in our nation's capital, where Barack Obama, a black man, was sworn in as the 44th president of these United States. I shared with you tonight that about my brother and many of my friends were not able to find a path out and many of them going to jail or killed in street violence. I shared with you tonight that I worked with youth all along the Gulf Coast and in each place and in each job I found the same thing, people needing help. This was and still is to this day a societal and American problem. Too many of our young brothers and sisters are being left behind, facing hardship and mortality for no fault of their own. Where's the help? How did I make it out and yet my own brother got trapped? We are fighting the same old system and institution today. The African-American experience is worthy of celebrating, and Black History Month matters to all of us who continue to fight for equality. Although our journeys are vastly different, learning one's culture helps us to be informed to avoid conflicts. We must be able to find our differences and the similarities <clears throat> that shape all of our experiences in life. By no means, by no means, am I the only outlier who successfully navigated a ghetto and found a path forward. Had it not been for so many people supporting me throughout my career, who knows if I would have been a victim of the criminal justice system, or addicted to alcohol or drugs, or living in poverty. I guess you could say I was lucky, but I challenge all of you to not ignore those that, help, that need help, to not allow our differences to stop us from doing what is right, and to not see a barrier without working hard to remove it. We owe it to ourselves to make this world a better place than what we found. As I conclude tonight, I challenge you to ask yourself, did you give your best today to improve someone's life? Have you shared your own challenges and hardships, good and bad times? How will you impact the next generation? I have spent three decades actively seeking out, supporting, and serving those in need. In the span of my career, I have seen the smile on someone's face when they realize someone believes in them. I have seen them cry when they have given up, and I said, keep pushing. I have seen them angry when they fall just short, and I say, get up, never give up. I have seen and witnessed transformation at its best in our country. And as a black man from an environment as tough as Happy Hill, I did not let Happy Hill dictate what I could be or who I am. So with that, folks, I want to say thank you for taking the time out to listen to my story and share my history. I look forward to hearing yours, and I wish you all the best and please stay safe. Thank you.